Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I have had a look at 28 pages of leaked document that purports to be the 10th edition rulebook. Unlike what I've seen and been told about the Imperial Guard rumors, a video I'll release later today or tomorrow, time zone dependent, this 20 plus page document is either really well done or it's a real book. Where would people have got the real book? Well, it has to exist for Games Workshop to start drip feeding us rules, and it would go out to staff who need to learn to play the game before the edition drops so that they can teach all the interested new people how to play the game. They can't be learning it at the same time they're trying to teach it. That just doesn't work. So I'm willing to believe that this is the real book. If it is a fake, then this is a massive amount of effort to go into it for very little clout. So like some friends who have found a cool stick, we're going to sit around and talk about the stick. The alleged leaks, which I'm willing to call leaks. So what we're going to talk about today are things I've spotted that haven't been confirmed yet by Games Workshop. So first of all, as with 9th edition, modifiers to hit are still capped at minus one or plus one. So you can't get higher or lower than that, even if you're some special rule plus shrouded, which is now called stealth in 10th edition, and you're firing a weapon and they don't have minus one anymore. Doesn't matter about heavy weapons, assault weapons, they don't give minus one. But anyway, it's capped at minus one for your hit modifiers. Good. This stops an 8th edition thing where armies like the Alpha Legion Chaos Space Marines could just keep stacking on minus one and minus one and then you were only hitting them on sixes and it was a very tedious army to play. For wounding, the table is still the same. We're not looking at a whole new table similar to what we had in like 3rd through to 7th edition. It's just the, if you're fighting against something that has higher toughness than your strength, then you need a 5+. plus. If it's double or more, then you need a 6+. plus. Same as what you used to. So it's good to have that confirmed that it's still going to be around. I really liked it because it's very simple to understand as long as you have a very basic grasp of maths. The wound roll is also capped at minus 1 or plus 1. Hence the Votan rules that we saw last week on Thursday. I did a short review on them. Their grudge tokens give you plus 1 to hit and plus 1 to wound at most. So we're not going to be seeing any of the silly stuff where they're wounding on plus three or automatically wounding on a four plus. Nothing like that. So thankfully, Leagues of Votan have been noticeably toned down. When it comes to combat and shooting, monsters and vehicles can shoot into the combat that they are fighting or shoot out of the combat at something else. Well, they are at minus one to hit. This is very similar to the Imperial Guard currently, where the turret weapons on the Lehman Brussels and things can shoot at a unit outside of the combat and you can keep your combat prowess going even though you're you know getting swarmed on by little dudes. Interestingly though the reverse is true and units not in combat can shoot the monster or vehicle that is in combat. So what you can't do in 10th edition is like you can't do the opposite of 8th edition where you tag your vehicle into a squad to try and keep it safe. In 8th edition you would charge a vehicle with a rubbish unit like cultists, the overpowered unit or Gretchen to stop all the big guns on the tank from firing. This explains why we weren't seeing the pistol keyword on vehicle weapons. It would have been a workaround. This rule also works. The blast rules, as rumored from the Manchester event, gives you plus one shot for every five models in the enemy unit. This makes more sense than the current blast where you get your normal number of shots shooting at an enemy unit of five, but you're gonna get a minimum of three if you're shooting an enemy unit of six. That just seemed a bit strange and really discouraged you for having oh i've got 11 unit models in this unit this is awful things like that it also means that you're not capped at your maximum number of shots that you can get on a d6 so a missile launcher with d6 shots if it's firing at a unit of 20 well you can get 10 hits if you roll a six because you're getting plus four one for every five models in that 20 man squad very nice Grab those grenade launch, seriously. These weapons just got a lot better. Now, as for the plasma guns and those sorts of weapons, they are hazardous. So no matter how many shots you make, you make one roll. It doesn't matter if you get all misses, all hits, roll ones, none of that matters. You roll one dice for each model that fired a hazardous gun, and one of those is destroyed if you roll a one. 
So this again gets rid of the, oh, I've got two people firing plasma guns. I've got to roll them separately, two dice for this one and then two dice for that one. You can keep the fast dice going because at the end of it, no matter how many shots you fired, you'll be rolling two dice. If either of them are ones, you take off one of those people that fired the plasma weapon much quicker. They're destroyed. Characters, monsters, and vehicles take three mortal wounds instead. The precision rule that we're going to see on sniper weapons is, as I suspected, you can choose to allocate the attack to a character in a unit and not the bodyguard. So you don't have to, and you might just want the bodyguard dead, then all of the other models in your army can be shooting at that character. The scout rule, as we saw with the gene stealer data sheet, this is as expected. You get to move a certain number of inches out of your deployment zone before the game starts. But this also applies to their transport. So scouting Dominion Battle Sisters in Immolator is a very nice option once again. There's a bit of a change to the fight phase. So you can only fight if you are in base contact with the enemy or base contact with the friendly model that's in base contact with the enemy. Some rules in 9th edition can be quite exploitative. They had it where the engagement range meant you were to be within half an inch of the enemy. So the show stealer ability for a succubus meant you could be, oh, I'm not quite in base contact. I'm like quarter of an inch away, kill someone and then run away before the enemy could attack, which you couldn't do if you were actually in base contact. The reason that this rule was introduced in 8th edition, 9th edition, was because a lot of the models hang over the edge of their base. So when you're trying to put them together base to base, it didn't quite work. So having that half inch extra space was really convenient. Then it got exploited quite a bit by all these extra rules and tournament players and such. So we're back to being base to base and you'll just have to swivel your models appropriately so that they can fit next to each other. As I mentioned in the Chaos Marine video, when you do an attack in close combat, you only attack with one melee weapon. And then you can also use weapons that have the extra attacks special rule. So this is as I thought, otherwise a Chaos Space Marine squad that was shooting would get 20 bulk gun shots, but if they were charging they would get 70 attacks if they had chain swords and combat weapons. Instead it's going to be 40 attacks with the chain swords. After you've done your fighting in combat, you can consolidate 3 inches further into combat, otherwise, like if all the enemies you charge were dead, you can consolidate towards the nearest objective. This makes sense that the unit would go for the objective and not fall off the objective, chasing the next target. The stratagems. So it's still once per phase per stratagem. So you won't be doing multiple rerolls throughout your phases. You won't be having multiple units using smokescreen. Same as normal, which is good. We have the epic challenge stratagem, which is a better way of doing the duels from 6th and 7th edition. So in those, you would choose one of your characters that would want to challenge an enemy character, including squad sergeants and unit leaders, and then your character could be zoomed straight across the unit into base contact with them. This way of doing duels is better. Your hero gets precision in close combat and can target the enemy character despite their bodyguard. Now the enemy doesn't get to hit you in the same way in return, they would also have to use that stratagem to do the same thing. The grenade stratagem. I was wondering how this worked. I thought it might be like a melter bomb to use against a tank kind of thing, since tanks are being so tough and infantry are gonna have pretty much no way to wound them in combat unless you're dedicated anti-tank or combat. It is an attack for the unit. You roll 66 regardless of your unit size. For each four plus, it's a mortal wound. So we're averaging three mortal wounds. It doesn't stop your unit from then shooting, but the grenades has to be done before the shooting so you can't try and finish off a nearly dead enemy using this stratagem. This may seem quite powerful, but three mortal wounds has been kind of average for a stratagem. The one I think is really powerful is Insane Bravery. It's one command point, and you can use it after you fail a battle shock test. That's very powerful because the way you win the game is by having units with an objective control score on objectives. If you fail the battle shock test, you lose your objective control and go down to zero. With this, it doesn't matter how scary the Dark Eldar are or how horrifying the Shadow in the Warp is for the Tyranids. You can just use this stratagem. Of course, it's just one of your units because you can only use this once per phase. We'll just pass that Battleshock test. You can keep hold of an objective that you thought you would otherwise lose and being able to do it after the failed test is what makes it really powerful. Another improved stratagem is Smoke. 
So a unit that can use smoke gains benefit of cover and stealth. So the benefit of cover in this edition, 10th edition, is always plus one save to a maximum of three plus. And the stealth gives you minus one to hit. So comparing that to 9th edition, this is like having dense cover and light cover all in one. And it makes your unit much tougher than they would be if it was just the current smoke launcher's ability, which several arms have, which gives minus one for the enemy to shoot at you in their shooting phase. Here's another one that's a bit of a twist. Heroic intervention. So it no longer happens with characters in the charge phase. It can be done on any unit except for vehicles that aren't walkers. So a Land Raider can't use it. Dreadnought can use it. War Walker can use it. It's a walker. It's got War Walker in the name. Of course it's a walker. It costs two command points and it gives you a counter move of six inches. However, you don't count as having charged. So you won't get the benefits like fight first or anything else that your unit gets from having been the one that charged. Still, being able to do this with pretty much any unit is quite the powerful reaction. Oh, you thought you were just charging some terminals to get off the objective? Well, now there's a can effects right there in with them. And the two command points in a game where we're seeing not a lot of command points, thankfully, means it's going to be used quite rarely. Before the battle starts, you can put a certain number of units into strategic reserves. It's very similar to how it works currently, but it's only 25% of your points of your army that can be in strategic reserves. It's a nice way of figuring it out, even though they lay out the numbers for you there. So at 1500 points, it would be 375 points could be in strategic reserves. This is not the same as being in reserves for things like Deep Strike. It's very similar to how it works currently, but you can't come on from your own deployment edge and ignore the need to be nine inches away from the enemy. That's something you can do currently, and it's a part of the rule that a lot of people miss out. It's wonderful for counter-attacking against enemy Deep Strike, but now in 10th edition, you can arrive from your opponent's edge in their deployment zone from turn three onwards. So I do hope they have something more powerful than just say 10 Eldar Guardians holding their home objective. I still recommend having 10 Eldar Guardians do it though. Maybe with a little bit of support or something that can move quickly backwards to counter the enemies that do this. You have until turn three. When it comes to the combat phase, there is no mention of fight last. It was very confusing when a unit with fight first also got fight last. When do they fight? Which one takes priority? Which player gets to fight first? No, which player gets to do fight first, last? Fight last first? It's confusing. Is it the active player or reactive player? Anywhere. Now there's just two steps. The units that fight first, and then everyone else. So all of the things that are like, aha, I tricked you, you actually get fight last, and I murder your guys if you just charge. Doesn't happen anymore. I'm glad to see that that's gone. That covers many of the things that took my interest from this. I'm still going to cover many of the faction focus armies that come out and give advice on how to use the army in 10th edition based on the rules and information that we have. Not a lot will change to my content there. So until I see you in my next video, I hope my darlings and viewers have a great day of 40k.